What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna be revisiting something that I brewed almost about a year ago. We are rebrewing the Belgian brown ale or Belgian brune uh, that I kind of screwed up last year. So when I brewed that, I had a pretty decent recipe, I think, but I pitched the yeast way too hot because I've been brewing with Kvike the entire like summer and just like habits kind of formed and I just dumped the yeast in at like 85 degrees, which you normally would do with Kvike. Long story short, that did not work very well for the beer. It's chock full of fusels. It was terrible. I had to dump it. Now, when you drink at a cafe in Belgium, you're generally, besides the uh, ubiquitous Pilsners, Stellar Artois and Jupiler, you're probably going to see only a few other selections of beers. Not all of them are Abbey style beers. In fact, most commonly, you're going to see both a blonde and a brune version of some type of local beer generally. The BJCP recognizes Belgian Blonde as its own style, but they do not recognize the Brune as its own style. The style that it's closest to is honestly the Double, um, but it's nothing like a Double in its character, which we'll get into here in a second. If you're looking for a relatively easy to find example of this style, I would recommend checking out Mikschuf by Brasserie de Chouf. This is basically their flagship Brune, and um, it's a very good example of the style. The characteristic thing to pay attention to here is that this is not a double. Just like all Belgian beers, this type of beer should be easy drinking, highly carbonated, relatively dry, packed full of malt flavor, along with yeast characteristics, um, and also relatively high in alcohol. In general though, this differs from a double in that it's not made with Abbey Ale yeast. Uh, you're not gonna generally use a Trappist strain for this. Also, it has a more pronounced dark roasted malt character than doubles do. The darkness in Abbey Ales is gonna come more from crystal malts and um, basically dark candy syrup uh, or candy sugar. In these Belgian brown ales, they actually generally don't have dark candy syrup in them. More often, it's actually a characteristic of using a darker, almost roasted and sometimes actually roasted malt. This McShoof here has a nice little edge of roastiness to it, uh, but nothing really more than a suggestion. It has a lot of dark fruit characteristics, uh, but at the end of the day, there's no real excessive spicy phenols or uh, heavy esters that are coming out of the yeast. It's actually relatively neutral, all things considered. Um, there's a little bit of a yeast character there and it's decidedly Belgian because I'm getting some banana um, and I'm getting a little tiny bit of like a clove spice. But at the end of the day, these beers really honestly are a lot simpler than doubles. Because I screwed this beer up last year, I did take the opportunity to slightly modify the recipe here. So I actually made this a far simpler recipe overall. And I did change some of the water chemistry elements of it relative to the Belgian brown ale that I made last year. So now before we jump into the video, I just wanna thank a few organizations for helping make it possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, they provided all the ingredients for the batch of beer. So you can find everything you need to make this beer on their website if you wanna go ahead and do that yourself. And secondly, Blickman Engineering for providing me the system which I'll be brewing on today which is their Blickman Brew Easy Compact Surface. This is the third beer I'll be making on that system so far. So the grist for starters is going to have 12 pounds of Dingemann's Belgian Pilsner as base malt in it. You're generally going to want to use Belgian Pilsner or Belgian Pale Malt for a base uh, when you're brewing any Belgian beer. So uh, adding to that one pound of Dingemann's Cara 8. This is a very light Belgian crystal malt which is going to help us uh, achieve a slightly higher final gravity than the typical Belgian ale. Um, I think that is going to give us a little bit more balance to help some of these uh, interesting and unique flavors kind of stand a little bit on their own. And then we're gonna add to that, uh, just for color and a slight roasted element, uh, half a pound of chocolate malt. Uh, this can really be any chocolate malt, to be honest. If you can find Belgian chocolate malt, that's the best option. Um, I unfortunately could not. And lastly, to get that ABV bumped up there a little bit, we're going to add two pounds of clear candy syrup. This is the Simplicity candy syrup. I'm electing not to use any sort of flavored candy sugar in this because I think it's going to actually add a few too many elements to the flavor. We want this to really be mostly just malt uh, and not too many uh, candy sugar elements. For the hops on this one, uh, relatively simple and straightforward as far as uh, Belgian ale go not too high on the IBU count but still going to have a little bit of Belgian hop character so we're going to be bittering with sots uh, and I'm going to add an ounce and a half of sots at 60 minutes for about 17 IBUs and then we are going to add a flavor addition with one ounce of Styrian Goldings at 10 minutes. For the water in this one, I'm using a similar water profile to my other Belgian beers that I made. Uh, I found this water profile really does work very, very well for them. Uh, so that water profile is 60 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. 
And in order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of reverse osmosis water and adding to that two grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and that's it. For the yeast in this one, this is one of the more important elements. When you're making a non-Trappist Belgian ale, uh, it's a great opportunity to use a non-Trappist Belgian yeast. Uh, you don't have to, you can use an Abbey Ale yeast if you really want to, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And one of those great options is the Brasserie de Chouf strain, which is uh, Imperial B45 Gnome. Brasserie de Chouf, once again, is the brewery that makes McChouf this shining example of a brew. And because this beer is going to be relatively high gravity, um, I did make a big starter for it. I made a two liter starter from two packets of Imperial Gnome, so it's a lot of cells, probably four or five hundred billion cells going into this uh, entire thing. For the mash in this one, I'm doing a step mash. It's not necessary uh, to do a step mash in a Belgian beer, but I think it really does help kind of uh, dial in the character you want as far as a balance of residual malt sweetness, uh, body, and head retention. I'll be doing a two-step Hoke Kurtz style step mash with uh, a 30 minute rest at 146 Fahrenheit, a 30 minute rest at 158 Fahrenheit, and then a final mash out at 170. I'm feeling pretty confident about this brew. I've made several Belgians before, and this is kind of following a similar template to uh, the successful ones that I've made already. So I think it'll work out pretty well. And Belgian Brune is honestly a fantastic style for this time of year. Darker beers kind of leading into the colder months, but also plenty of alcohol to keep you warm. So um, as we approach the end of fall here, I'm excited to try and uh, kind of capture that in a glass. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the brew day. So I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my uh, Blickman Brew Easy Compact Surface and started to heat that up to the first target rest temperature of 146 Fahrenheit. As this was going on, I measured out my water salts and I added those into the strike water as well. And I also milled out all of my grain and got that ready for later. As soon as the strike water reached the target mash in temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill, being sure to always break up clumps and just make sure it was fully distributed. And then I set up the recirculation system uh, to make sure we had a good solid recirculation. About 10 minutes into the mash, I pulled a mash pH sample just to confirm how things were going. And I found a pleasantly on target mash pH of about 5.25. So I did nothing to change or correct the mash pH. I let the mash sit at 140 for about 30 minutes before the Blickman Brew Commander stepped up the mash automatically to the next step of 158 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes more, and then automatically raised it up one more time to the mash out step uh, of 170 and held it there for 15 minutes as well. Once the mash out was complete, I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for about 15 minutes as well, and then finally started to ramp up to a boil. I usually manually input a temperature right below boiling to avoid a boil over but get a jump start on things as the, the basket is draining, and that worked out pretty well in this case, so I did that, and then once I hit the boil, I added my 60 minute hop addition, which was an ounce and a half of SOTS. I let the SOTS sit in the boil for about 50 minutes before I got to the 10 minute mark where I added my one ounce of Styrian Goldings, and I also added a uh, Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient at this time. But also, this is the point where I added in my two pounds of Simplicity Candy Syrup. I just made sure to squeeze those out fully, rolling them up like a tube of toothpaste, and stirring them thoroughly into the boiling wort. Once the boil finished, about 10 minutes later, I conducted a quick whirlpool. I was able to pile up all of the trube and the hop debris in a nice cone in the center of the kettle and uh, pass through my counterflow chiller in a single pass, chilling uh, down to close to my pitching temperature into my anvil bucket fermenter, where I continued to chill it over the next several hours down to my target pitch temperature of about 65 uh, in my fermentation chamber. Once I reached that target pitch temperature, I pitched the entire two liter yeast starter. And the final thing that I did before leaving it to ferment was pull a sample for the original gravity measurement. This was done after the yeast starter was added, so there's no dilution factor, and it came in at 1068, which was exactly my target OG, so that was great. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, and as this is kind of true for all Belgian beers, to be honest, it's relatively important that you choose a Belgian ale strain that suits the character that you want to get out of this particular beer. If you're making a Trappist beer, choose a monastic ale strain of some kind. If you're making a non-Trappist beer, I recommend using a standard Belgian ale yeast that's not Trappist. And that's what I'll be doing today. If you want to use a Trappist yeast for this type of beer, that's totally fine. You're just kind of diverging into the region of brewing a Belgian double when you do that. Um, 
but it's totally okay. I mean, if that's the kind of character you want out of your beer, then more power to you. If you choose Trappist Strain, it's going to be a lot more estery, expressive, um, probably pump out a lot more phenols as well. You're gonna get a lot of banana, a lot of clove, a lot of pear, usually a lot of bubble gum as well, uh, and lots of other just distinctively Belgian characters. And as I mentioned, I'll be using Imperial Gnome for this, which is the Achoof Strain, a non-Trappist Belgian ale strain. Very similar character to the Trappist strains in general, but it's a lot more fruity. Um, and it also has a nice like spice element to it that you don't necessarily get with the uh, Trappist strains. It has a little bit of a layer of bubble gum on top, but it's not really the same thing. Trappist strains really kick off a lot more banana and pear. This one really kicks off a lot more apple and like kind of almost a lychee character as well. So Imperial Gnome is also available as Y3522 Arden Ale and also WLP550 Belgian Ale. For this particular strain, there does not really seem to be a uh, dry alternative, so if you are stuck using only dry yeast, I would recommend just going with Lalamand Abbey. It's a fantastic dry strain. It does a phenomenal job when fermenting uh, Belgian ales, and I've used it many times to make some fantastic Belgian ales before. So yes, it is a Trappist source strain, so just do keep that in mind. Maybe ferment it a bit colder than um, otherwise to try and uh, limit the amount of fruity esters that you're gonna get from that particular strain, um, but it should do a pretty fantastic job nonetheless. As always, Belgian Belgian ale fermentation is a bit unique. You kind of want to straddle this weird gap uh, between having a stressed fermentation and a healthy fermentation. Uh, you're also going to be messing with the temperature a little bit too to get the most you can out of the yeast without it becoming too much. In general, when you're fermenting any Belgian ale, there's a number of guidelines to really abide by to get the best possible results. The first is pitch a lot of healthy yeast. These are high gravity beers, make no mistake. Um, so you want to make sure you're pitching a good amount of yeast. If you're using dry yeast, that's two packets. If you're using liquid yeast, make a starter, get four or 500 billion cells in there if you can. It is only going to help you. On the homebrew scale, you're not likely to over pitch. So honestly, even if you're throwing four or 500 billion cells into your fermentation, you're still gonna get plenty of yeast character out of that. Second guideline is to pitch it cold. Start it at like 60 to 65 degrees and then let it go hotter from there. Um, so Belgian fermentations are dynamic. They're going to change over time. The Belgian yeast produce a lot of heat when they ferment, and they've actually adapted to be very good at producing desirable flavors at higher temperatures. But in general, you do not want to pitch them hot because they're not ready for that shock yet. This is the exact mistake that I made last time I brewed this Belgian brown ale. So just keep that in mind. Once you pitch your yeast, let the fermentation begin, and then what I really think is the, the key to getting the right amount of yeast character in your Belgian brews is to let it free rise. Let the yeast and natural heat that it produces during fermentation just take care of changing the temperature to whatever that yeast feels like is comfortable for it. Um, just don't mess with it, let it do what it wants to do, to be honest. The best way to do this is if you have some sort of temperature control, just basically set a high level that you don't want it to exceed. What I would recommend is about 80 to 82 degrees as a maximum uh, fermentation temperature. And then after that, just remove whatever uh, heat source you use to control your temperature. Basically you're saying, I want this fermentation to do what it wants to do and naturally build up its own heat, but only up to 80 or 82 degrees. At that point, turn on the cold and start to chill things back down to keep them at that level. The reason you want to let it free rise is because Belgian yeast can actually crap out and stall on you if you prematurely uh, chill it and actually bring that temperature down, it can be bad for the yeast. They can actually discourage the yeast from fermenting. I have not personally experienced this, but I know it is something that they have a reputation for. And lastly, I would not recommend pressure fermenting this one. You can spund it if you want to uh, and let the natural carbonation build up to carbonate the beer on its own, um, but you want to leave those first several days of fermentation really open and let the yeast have as much opportunity as it can to produce delicious esters and phenols. That's very important for getting a proper yeast character in the beer. After that, you know, a couple days into fermentation, you should have generated most of the esters that you're going to generally get. The yeast have multiplied and they're start gonna, they're gonna start cleaning things up. So at that point, if you wanna go ahead and cap things up, spun it, let it naturally carbonate. If you have the setup for it, then um, by all means go for it. But that basically is it. It's not really all that crazy, um, but there is a little bit of a dynamic element to it. So I just recommend you pay attention to that and you should be just fine. So just to recap, I'll be pitching in four or 500 billion cells of Imperial 
will know them once the wort gets down to about 65 degrees and I will let it free rise and free ferment all the way up until about 82 uh, degrees as a maximum. And then from there, just let it do its thing for about a week or two. Because of the large amount of yeast and the higher gravity, um, we're probably going to need maybe an extra week on the back end for the flavors to round out a little bit. Um, but I'm not really expecting too much time in the fermenter overall for this. So probably two to three weeks. And then once that period is complete, we'll go ahead, we'll package and we'll put it on tap once it is tasting pretty good. So I am very excited to see this goes and I'll catch you in a few weeks so until then cheers fermentation with this beer went really well overall uh, the fermentation was pretty fast all things considered finishing up in about 12 days and um, finished at a much lower than anticipated final gravity of 10.04 uh, which got us to a much higher than anticipated level of ABV at 8.4 but nonetheless the beer is still delicious. Once that fermentation was complete, I transferred to the keg and then let it condition in the keg for another week or so before putting it on tap, carbonating it, and then uh, also letting it sit in the keg for another couple weeks um, to really round its flavor out. So the beer is called No Mish, and it comes in at 8.4% ABV and 22 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it pours a really nice dark amber color. Um, not quite brown, so more of like a rusty dark red uh, or light brown maybe. Um, really, really great looking color though. Absolutely crystal clear. That yeast dropped out really fast. And then also has a pretty robust kind of ivory colored head. The head retention of the beer is unfortunately not the best. Um, it pours with a great fluffy head that has good construction, but it falls relatively fast and then leaves a layer on the surface. All right, so let's jump in for aroma now. So first and foremost, uh, the aroma is definitely dominated by the Belgian yeast, uh, getting a lot of like estery character out of this. Uh, so a little bit of kind of like a fruity character, kind of like an apple, almost a pear. Um, and then I'm getting a hint of a darker malt as well. And then a little bit of a spice, like a clove spice actually. Um, really quite nice. Now let's go for mouthfeel. Mouthfeel on this beer is quite light. Um, overall, not as light as it would look on paper though. Despite finishing at 10.04, the 8.5% ABV really does kind of amplify the mouthfeel a little bit. I think at the end of the day, it ends up being more of a medium mouthfeel, uh, kind of round character to it. Uh, not quite soft, not quite hard, um, but definitely a supportive mouthfeel for all the nice flavors that are involved in this beer. And uh, speaking of which, I think it's time we go in for flavor. Mm -hmm. This beer is really, really interesting. Um, so it has gone through a tremendous flavor evolution in its life. Um, when it was much, much younger, it had a very, very earthy flavor to it. Um, almost reminiscent of like a rooibos tea, like a red tea. It was like a very almost tannic earthy flavor. Um, that is gone now. And I think that came from the chocolate malt. That little addition of chocolate malt kind of added a bit of an earthy edge to things. Um, and you can definitely taste it in the beer, but it's not to the degree that it was before. And now it's actually really rounded itself out quite a lot. It also didn't used to be as estery and perfumey and generally pleasant from the yeast side of things uh, as it is now. Uh, and that's just a little bit of age coming in there and conditioning the beer. But yeah, let's actually really dive into it and break it down because this is actually one of the more complex Belgian beers I've made recently. Really quite pleasant flavors. So firstly, I get a really nice kind of herbal hop bitterness. That's that really nice combination of sots and stearia and goldings. Those are two hops that work really well together. Um, and it just provides a really quite nice 
very, very appropriate bitterness. Um, and then we move into more malt complexity and malt flavors. Because of that high alcohol content, it definitely has some subtle sweetness to it as well. A little bit of a honey note in the background. And then there's that really kind of nice, um, like slight dark cherry, dark fruit character that's coming from the Caramunic. Very, very slight overall, not overdone at all. Um, and it has a really uh, great little bit of toffee note as well, uh, which is quite satisfying. And then we get a little bit more roasted malt character than I might expect. Um, and honestly, a little bit more than I might prefer. It has that kind of dry earthiness that I talked about earlier, although it's much, much more subdued than what it used to be, uh, which is good. It is a flavor that blends well with the beer. Uh, so don't get me wrong, it's not a bad flavor at all, and it works really well. It just kind of throws the beer out of balance a little bit, I think, and that's really the main issue I have with it. I think that chocolate malt addition really does add a really cool dimension to the beer, though. It adds a little bit of like a, a figginess to it as well, a dark fruit, like very, very dark fruit. Um, and it blends well into the toffee caramel notes as well. And this is again where it comes down to not being a double. But really the most interesting thing here is the yeast, I think. This fermentation went off beautifully. The fermentation was done really fast and it pushed itself up to a max of about 75 degrees. So nothing too crazy on the ester department, but I'm getting a lot of nice bubble gum and spice, like the quintessential Belgian uh, yeast characteristics that everyone loves. Nothing too crazy in terms of cloves, nothing too crazy in in terms of like banana and apple, um, which are not my favorite esters overall. Uh, this is really quite nice. You get that bubblegum characteristic really blends together with these, these flavors beautifully. And in fact, as this beer warms up, it really does bring a lot more flavor to the surface. It's very subtle and nuanced flavors. It's kind of almost got a little bit of a floral note coming through now, um, which is really nice. There's many layers to it. So it's a really interesting beer, very underappreciated style. It's outshone by the double, I think, and outshone by other dark Belgian uh, ales, but this is something that I would definitely brew again. As far as potential improvements go, though, I do have a few for the beer. Firstly, I think I would dial back that chocolate malt addition by maybe 20%. And secondly, I think I might add a little bit of colored candy syrup into this. I use the simplicity because I thought that that would just stay out of the way flavor-wise, and it was correct in that assumption, but it also led to the beer being, I think, a shade or two lighter than I would have expected. This is a beautiful amber color. I really am very happy with the color on this beer, but it's a shade lighter than brown. In most examples that I've seen, these ales are more of a brown color. Um, so adding in maybe a D45 or D90 candy syrup addition uh, would really have benefited the color and it would have added some other flavors in there as well. Those candy syrups tend to throw in a lot of nice like raisiny characters, um, which definitely would be pretty good. And again, it's very similar to a double at that point, um, but there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. Overall though, the beer is great. It's very drinkable, very enjoyable. I don't think that chocolate malt issue is really a, a big one at all. Um, and it's something that I'm gonna continue to enjoy. It is a far, far, far better rendition of this style than what I did last year. And that is a big win in my book as well. So if you enjoyed the video and you learned something before you leave, please hit that like button. It does help a lot. And subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below with your thoughts on the whole thing and just let me know what you think about uh, this beer, this brewing process, all these things. If you wanna support the channel, Channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this design and many others in my merchandise store, which is down in the description box. I also have a Patreon and my Patreon supporters are huge in helping out this channel a lot. You're not only helping to improve the production quality of the whole thing, but also helping me get some really cool gadgets and stuff. Things that I've really actually wanted to try out. Things that will make themselves known in the very near future. If you want to support the channel in different ways, I also have channel memberships and there's the super thanks button as well if you're curious about either those things i really appreciate them nonetheless there's an amazon store that i have in the description box which has all of my recommended home brewing equipment that's available on amazon as well as my channel production equipment if you're curious about those things and i also have an instagram and facebook if you want to check out what's going to be coming to the channel in the very near future and want to follow me on more platforms than just youtube and last but certainly not least if you're still here watching this video i really do appreciate you watching the whole thing um, i do put a ton of work into these things and now that i've got a brand new kid sitting over there um I really do have a lot more uh, hurdles to overcome to get these videos out, but I really appreciate your support nonetheless, and I'm hoping you're still enjoying these videos as much as I'm enjoying making them for you. And so, until the next one, cheers.